this is something that you don't normally see. Um, I'm showing you the spectral response, and this is the actual measured spectral response of uh, the Genesis camera. And um, I'm going to show you uh, uh, some other color filter arrays, actually a very good still camera made by Canon later. But immediately, um, what you're seeing here, which is not normal, is you're seeing the peak transmission, which, as you see, is about 50%. This is a two-thirds inch camera that uses a prism. And two things are immediately obvious. Um, the slopes are much sharper. The, what we call the crosstalk, the crossover regions are much smaller than here and here, and um, um, here and here. And they're much narrower, but they're also much more efficient. You see, we're getting close to 90%. So when you're building, um, a camera with a color filter array, um, because you, these are pigments basically, literally lithographically printed on top of the pixels, um, the, the, the choice of the color of, of saturation of these devices basically determines the sensitivity of the camera. We get away with that for a reason that I'll show you later, which is, has to do with the super 35 millimeter uh, uh, sensor size. Another issue that I was asked to address is how do we color balance a camera? Um, these two graphs, this is the spectral power distribution of uh, um, what we call illuminant D65. That's not sunlight, which is usually considered to be 5,000, 5,500 Kelvin. This is a you know, this is skylight, which is a combination of sunlight and the blue sky. Um, and this is standard aluminum A, which is uh, warmer than uh, 3200. It's 2856 Kelvin, for those who care. Um, and it's actually much more likely, if you actually make a real color temperature measurement in the studio, you're more likely to get this number than, uh, uh, than the 3200, unless you put a transformer to boost the... Uh, so. The, the, the problem that we have to deal with with a digital camera is this is what we'd really like. We'd like to have equal blue, green, and red. Um, and I've sort of centered these in the peaks of where uh, uh, the color analysis normally goes. Um, and the way I like to think about these when I'm about color balancing the camera is I like to think about this as a kind of a, think about this as a beam balance. Now, right now, it's balanced. And we don't change the green. We're going to pivot uh, uh, around the green. So the blue will go up or the blue will go down. So basically, this is what happens if we're going to shoot with that camera uh, that's perfectly balanced uh, um, in terms of its outputs to, some, to uh, an arbitrary light source that doesn't exist, that has equal value in red, green, and blue. And what you see is that you have very little blue light. So in order to color balance this, the, 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 this camera back to equal, what we need to do is we need to boost that blue signal. In fact, we need to double it. Um, there's about 60 B of gain uh, on the blue channel on any CCD or CMOS camera if it's balanced for tungsten. Uh, there's 60 B more gain in the blue channel. And of course, we've got a surfeit of, uh, of red and infrared, and we need to reduce the gain in the red signal. If we balance for daylight, of course, we've got all the blue in the world, um, and this camera will appear to be less noisy. But of course, I would think that uh, from a practical photographic standpoint, most of the time we're working, or, or not most of the time we're working with tungsten light, but that's the light source of which we have the least amount of light. When you're outside in daylight, usually um, you've got lots of light. So in this instance, what you do is you actually decrease the blue gain and you increase the red gain. Uh, this is not you know, linear or, shall I say, logarithmic, but basically you'd have to increase the red gain about 2.5 dB um, and uh, uh, reduce the blue gain uh, somewhat similar. So um, most uh, traditional uh, uh, electronic cameras uh, are naturally balanced for tungsten because that's the worst case. Um, and, but that's also where you will get uh, the most 
uh, noise. So you have to be careful when you measure signal to noise that you um, understand how the camera is color balanced and color balance it appropriately for the light source that you're using when making the measurements. Um, someone was asking me about uh, uh, earlier on about film. Um, you know, the, when you project film, because it's not bandwidth limited, if you get closer to the scene where you see more information. Um, this um, uh, is the curves that were created um, from that little test target that I showed you earlier on that we use, which automatically generates a curve. Um, and um, this actually was uh, um, from the prototype Genesis camera uh, uh, during the shoot that Alan Davio did uh, when in uh, May 2004, I think. And um, what you see, and this is one of the issues with, with, uh, 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 with, the, with the electronic camera, the, 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 all of the convolution of the, uh, uh, the various uh, uh, elements necessary to get uh, to, the, to the, uh, um, the, the film negative um, are basically eliminated with a digital camera. So you get a free ride. You get more MTF from a digital camera because you don't have um, to, uh, uh, in the case of, of the, 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 the 5218 negative, um, it had to be re-photographed um, onto another CCD um, with another lens, you know, the printing lens. So this is what you're seeing here. And this is when people have looked at the, these images and have questioned why does the digital image look so sharp, it's because you have reduced the number of um, components in that MTF, uh, uh, in that MTF uh, uh, equation. Um, this is um, one of my favorite cameras. It's getting quite old now, but uh, you'll see a similar uh, uh, um, uh, uh, response characteristic. And um, there's uh, quite a bit of crosstalk. Um, this, of course, is a bear pattern uh, uh, camera uh, that has nothing to do with the, the actual color. But cameras like uh, this camera and modern digital still cameras use very sophisticated algorithms to process uh, the Bayer pattern. And in fact, you know, whenever we've made measurements with these cameras, they seem to uh, uh, exceed Nyquist. I mean, they, they do a remarkable job. <laughs> uh, of course, they're not really. And in fact, your explanation of the diagonal sampling is really what's going on. But it is quite, you know, it is quite remarkable the performance you can get from these. However, the problem is there are residual aliases. And um, these cameras use uh, image processing that is contextual. In other words, it can, it can understand that it's looking at sky and greenery or a graphic and, processes and, and can process accordingly. Digic 3 is a new processor, I believe. Um, the three sensor prism system, um, I'm only mentioning this because I'm going to show you a camera that is a true 4K camera. And it uses a prism system, and it uses three CMOS sensors um, uh, that, that were developed by, believe it or not, by Panavision Silicon Video Imaging. Um, and there, each of the sensors is 3840 by 2160. But this is the general, this is the, the original Philips prism. And I've actually went to the trouble of making sure all these angles are correct, <laughs> because most of the public stuff isn't. Um, now, the difference in uh, efficiency between the color filter arrays and the, uh, 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 the interference filters in the prism, this is where we make it up. This is uh, um, a 2 3rd inch sensor in scale to the Super 35 sensor, the Super 35, the D format in film, which is 16 by 9, 27 and a half millimeter diagonal. This is the same uh, sensor size as Genesis. Um, as I said before, I'm, I've been using this little picket fence to illustrate this frequency response issue for a long time. This uh, um, is half the Nyquist limit. You know, Larry was talking about the Nyquist limit on the two-third inch sensor being 100 cycles per millimeter. What we try to do um, is, again, optimizing for these lower frequencies. We always try to optimize to get the highest contrast at half Nyquist. And so 20 cycles for this big sensor so it really makes the job of the lens designer a lot easier than the guy that has to do this. Um, because the Nyquist here is 40 cycles, and here it's 100 cycles. And it's very, very hard 
to, it's much harder. Um, you need to have a lens that's two and a half times as good to cover that little two-thirds inch format compared to this big film format. And it takes six of those to match the area of this, which is where we make up the difference in, uh, um, in, 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 in optical efficiency of the uh, color filter array versus the interference filter. Um, and this is Super 35 film, and this is Super 35 sensor. Um, actually, this is a new sensor. Um, it's not the sensor that's in Genesis. It's a CMOS sensor um, with 37.5 million pixels. This is um, the Genesis structure. And as you see, what it is is stripes. If you ever take a magnifying glass, if you've still got a Trinitron CRT, you'll see that the, uh, the, the stripes line up like this. And um, it's 5,760 pixels um, by 2,160 pixels. And, um, but we are, what we output is 1920 by 1080 RGB. So um, if you wanted to, you could say it was a 6 uh, megapixel or a 6K sensor, but really, you know, it's a little bit like, well, you know, I, um, I weigh 200 pounds. It's a lot better to say that I weigh 80 kilos. It's just it's a nice number. Um, th here is your, um, this is a discussion that we have to have, but for sure, in a bear pattern, the issue is that you have twice as many green uh, as you do have red and blue. And for any operation where you need equal bandwidth, like shooting blue screen or green screen, um, we uh, really prefer the 444 sampling. It almost makes me laugh because you know most of the you know most of the uh, 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 the studios out there are insisting for features that record 444. But of course. If you start off with 422, what you're basically doing is interpolating to create the other half bandwidth, plus the fact that in this you know, stripe uh, uh, um, um, configuration, a DPX file is uh, uh, 8 megabytes. This um, is 32. So you know, whatever you want to image process, but you're processing you know, a lot of empty pixels for no more spatial resolution. This, by the way, is a true 4K camera, or using the new math, a 12K camera. Um, and that's the camera that uses the three 30, uh, uh, 38, 40 by 2160 pixels. The images from these, by the way, and, and, and I, should have, I should have thought to put one of the images in there. The images from these, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have the dynamic range of, um, or at least the scene dynamic range of, of a motion picture film, um, but it does have a spatial resolution that you will see. The only f film format that looks anything like it is IMAX. Um, and uh, um, this, of course, is the camera head, but there's a whole parcel of electronics, and nobody's going to be putting this in a Steadicam anytime soon. But you have to remember, you know, that, that, that um, the, the predecessor to the Genesis camera um, was in 1991, the HTC 500, uh, which was a three-chip 1920, 1080 camera. And that camera and its processing weighed about 200 pounds. Uh, the camera head was very small, but all the associated processing. So, you know, in 10 years, um, we will certainly see cameras like this uh, being you know, mounted on the shoulder or steady cam near you. And I think that's it for me. Thank you very, very much.